Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you, as always, by InsideThePenguins.com, an affiliate of the Hockey News. Make sure you bookmark InsideThePenguins.com for all of your off-season storylines surrounding the Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined, as always, by Nick Horwatt, and we're going to talk a little bit about the depth of the Pittsburgh Penguins, whether that be at the NHL level and at the organizational depth at the AHL level on today's episode. And then we have a couple listener questions, not one, but two listener questions to get to in the final segment of today's show. Should be a good one, Horwat. But since we last spoke, well, I won't say last spoke, because for the first time in almost a year, mm -hmm. we saw each other in person, actually, at the Ed Sheeran concert in Pittsburgh. A little, little nice face-to-face -face meetup. Uh, even if it was me, I, I was hungover, so I wasn't. You were hungover, and I was show. drunk. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it was a good meeting of the minds. But yeah, it's uh, always good seeing your uh, co-host in person. Always good seeing your friends in person. And hey, you know what? We'll be seeing each other again in a handful of weeks for someone's big lucky day, and yeah, we'll we'll go from there. And uh, you know what? It's it. It's the slow season also, boys. It's uh it's it's not fun right now. It's boring. It's just we're it's just sitting around waiting for the Carlson trade to happen and then maybe other things can happen and then who knows. Also, mm -hmm. oh, maybe Kyle Dubas just signed another depth forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's right now obviously a lot of just pontificating on what Kyle Dubas has done over the past five weeks. There's a lot of trying to project what the lineup would be, what the roster is going to look like. And of course, there is the Eric Carlson trade that's hanging over everything. Uh, we talked before the show. We're not really going to get into that just because there's no new news. I mean, Elliot Freeman said, hey, it's down to two teams, but it has been for what, two weeks, like practically. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to leave that alone and wait for actual news on the front of Eric Carlson and the Pittsburgh Penguins. But there was actual news over the weekend as the Penguins added two more depth pieces Let's start with Vinny Hanestroza. Other than having an elite name at 29 years of age, the Penguins signed him to a one-year contract at $775,000 on the AAV. Or what, what did you think about Vinny Hanestroza coming to the Pittsburgh Penguins organization? I like the deal. I like I like the player. I like it's. I mean, can't go wrong with a one-year contract. Been most on most occasions, uh, especially one that doesn't touch a million dollars. You there, <laughs> yes. there's no arguing. Uh, this contract here, the guy, you know, has had a 39 point season before, so almost 40. And he did that with Arizona, no less. Um, he might be able to bring it, it. It's a depth option. I mean, there's not too much deep, deeper you can dig onto a guy like this. Um, you know, he's going to be a good depth option. He's going to be someone who is that replacement level player, something that the Penguins severely lacked last season, whatever. Uh, you look into it, they were digging into, I mean, yeah, the prospects got call-ups they deserved, but then Drake Kajula was getting called up. Um, I mean, the Penguins were fortunate enough to not be as injured as normal last season, so we didn't have to dig into the well of, who's this guy, right? Yeah. Um, whereas, at least now, we're stacking up with NHL-ready talent, uh, no matter what, and we'll get into it, but it's going to make the AHL team super entertaining this year too. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned Drake Kajula because this is the comparison that I make. I mean, they're not the same player by any any stance of the word, but they're in the similar situation. They're the veteran that's probably going to start the season at the AHL level unless they light it up in training camp and, and just blow everybody away when it comes to the, the coaching staff. But I see Vinny Hinestroza as, like you mentioned, that, Drake Kajula, that in case of injury call up, that that guy that's going to go down to the AHL and help out the young players down at the AHL because Hinestroza, he's had more than a cup of coffee in the NHL level. Last season, he was with the Buffalo Sabres, a very young team up there, a team that has a lot of spots for younger players. And Hinestroza was just bumped out of the lineup more often than not. He played 26 games last season, scored 11 points, two of them being goals, nine of them being assists. I don't hate the signing, and like you mentioned, as many players as you can get on, I believe, two-way deals. Yeah, I think both him and Janssen, who we'll talk about, got two-way contracts. As many players as you can get on two-way deals, that works. Of course that works. And I'm just trying to flip through some of the old WBS rosters to kind of see who we're talking about. I mean, last year, 
we didn't have many call ups, be- thankfully, because there wasn't uh, a ton of injuries on the Penguins side. But you look at some of these names, they just they didn't fit an NHL roster quite yet. You know what I mean? That's why Drake Kajula came to mind right away. He's a guy that got a call up to the NHL, got a little bit of playing time because he has the experience. Uh, whereas, because you're not going to call up Jordan Fresca, you're not going to, you know, Nathan Legare isn't going to get that kind of call. Kyle Olson might one day. It's, it's a lot of moving parts into this, and it's good now that we have a plethora of options when it comes to, hey, we have some banged up forwards. Um, who can we pick from? Well, we have a bunch of names. Take your pick of the litter and just see how it goes, especially if it is uh, injury replacement and not here's your trial. Here's mm-hmm. your experience. Give it. Here's your nine games so we don't burn the ELC kind of thing. It's yeah. here's your here you go. So it's it's good to have both of those options at the ready. Mm-hmm. And I was I was mistaken. Both Henestrosa and Andreas Janssen signed one way deals. It so is what it is. They'll make the same money whether they're in the AHL or the NHL. For Henestrosa, that's seven hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. For Andreas Janssen, former Toronto Maple Leaf, that is a one-year eight hundred thousand dollar contract. And while yes, Henestrosa, you expect to start in the AHL. I fully see Andreas Janssen having an opportunity to not just crack the Penguins roster but to potentially be a a swing middle six guy for the Pittsburgh Penguins next season. It's similar to Danton Heinen last season where, yes, this is a player that has previously scored 20 goals at the National Hockey League level. This is a player that has shown promise but has not shown consistency at the NHL level, and he's been passed around a little bit, played for the New Jersey Devils to start last season. And similar to what happened to Henestrosa in Buffalo, a lot of young players on the New Jersey Devils was not space for for somebody in Andreas Janssen who wasn't performing and was a little bit older, hence the reason he wasn't given as much opportunity. He was part of the Timo Meyer deal and got sent to the San Jose Sharks, played a couple of games with the Sharks, but at the end of the day, played only 13 in total last season, scoring zero goals and adding three assists. Somebody looking for a fresh start, somebody looking for a little bit of an opportunity is Andreas Janssen, and his former general manager, Kyle Dupas, is going to give that to him in Pittsburgh. That's the beauty of all these guys. I, even Henestrosa could probably fight for an NHL an NHL job. It's depending on how you look at what Drew O'Connor does or what Alex Nylander does. If you know those two end up not having great camps or preseasons, well, we, we got backup options, right? That's kind of the beauty of having these guys laying around. And Andreas Johnson just another perfect example of that, of having him laying around is going to be good for the team. He's a former 40-point 40 40 guy, like you said, 20 goals. Uh, 23 assists on top of that season in 18, 19 as a 24 year old. It's uh, it, you know, he has to get back to something like that. Cause it's, you know, been a couple years removed since then. And, and uh, I mean, you look at the years he spent in New Jersey, those weren't the great years, mm-hmm. right? The, those weren't productive years with where his teammates were helping him out as much as they could. I mean, it's probably a big reason why he put up 43 with Toronto. I forget who he was playing with, but wherever you look on the 18, 19 Toronto Maple Leafs, you're playing with, Marner, Matthews, Nylander, maybe Tavares was there at that point. I vaguely remember Andreas Janssen always being paired up with Kasperi Kapanen. <sighs> Oddly enough, I always remember like just just from those years when we were watching the, the the Maple Leafs and they're basically you know doing the same thing. They were great in the regular season, bad in the postseason. I remember Andreas Janssen was always at least to start when fully healthy. It was him and Kapanen, I believe, on the third line, and then they bump up and down based on injuries and and how the certain team was going. Because you know Mike Babcock, he's uh, not a patient coach. And back then, he was the head coach still of the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, just reading some of these names, though, like it, no matter who you are on this team, you're going to... The points are going to find you. because It, like, it might have been Kadri. Because there was Marner, there was Matthews, there was Tavares, there was Morgan Riley on defense, who had 52 assists that year. There was Nazem Kadri, who also had 44 points, with Kasperi Kapanen, who had 44 points. Uh someone on that lineup everywhere yeah. was getting yeah. points. I mean, William Nylander had 27. Was that his holdout year? No. Played 57 games or 54 games. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. Um, But that, yeah, 22 years old. That was probably his holdout year. So later in the season, yeah. Nylander's there also uh, dishing it around for 20 assists. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that was a good team. No matter who you were in that somewhere in that lineup, you were getting – healthy production uh so now and, and the years since then for 
he also, like, like we said, he went to New Jersey during the years of we're still trying to figure out who we are. Mm-hmm. I mean, they weren't supposed to be that good this season. Yeah. So then there was that, and then, you know, just a handful of games in San Jose, nothing. Stick Johnson with guys that can help him produce. I mean, not much at this bottom six to do that, but I don't think he's going to play at the top here. So we'll see how it goes. But you stick him with guys that can produce, and he can help just as much. Yeah, and for those who were looking for speed, Mike Sullivan included, Andreas Janssen will bring that. And he, he does help the foot speed of the Pittsburgh Penguins. And for those, I see you in the comments, guys. For those that say well, we want players under the age of 30, there's two right there. 29 years old for Vinny Henestrosa, 28 years old for Andreas Janssen. Before we head to the next segment, here is the one thing that I really like about both of these signings. Both of these players are players that we both mentioned could fight for a roster spot out of camp, or at some point this season, you could see them playing at the NHL level, and it doesn't seem like they'd be out of place on this current Pittsburgh Penguins roster. But if the young players in the system, Alex Nylander, Valtteri Pustinen, Sam Poulin, if they prove that they're ready, I could give two craps if one of these guys gets placed on waivers and claimed. Because if those young guys are ready, these two guys are not going to be roadblocks. It felt a little bit more like a roadblock with Danton Heinen last year, right? Because the Pittsburgh Penguins, he was going into his second season. They got him on a deal, but he just came off a year where he scored, what, 18 goals, 15 of them at five on five. There's no chance they're going to send Danton Heinen down. And, and it, to be honest, there wasn't really an opportunity. Yes, I would have liked to see Valtteri Pusinen. We eventually saw Alex Nylander, but... According to the organization, at least the one that was in place yet last year, they weren't ready to come up and make that NHL level impact. This year, there's a chance. Pull in. We'll see where he's at after taking that sabbatical last season. Coming back, we saw him at prospect development camp. And from all the reports, it seems like he's in a very good spot right now mm-hmm. entering training camp. Valtteri Pustin, I'm still very high on him, but as time goes on, it feels like the organization wants him to marinate a little bit more in the AHL, and I'll bite that bullet. I'll take it. It's fine. Alex Nylander signed that one-year contract. Andreas Janssen is direct competition with Alex Nylander now because both guys can play both sides, and both guys seemingly would be a fit on the Pittsburgh Penguins' third line. So I like this because it it sparks competition, but it doesn't put roadblocks in front of the younger guys if they are ready to come up. Your pool ends. If Legere comes out of nowhere and gets back on track this season, if Lucas Svedkovsky in year two of his professional career takes a massive jump, he's 21. Again, that would be a lot to ask, but these are things that could potentially happen. So mm-hmm. I like it because you're not blocking the road. You're not buying a lot of capital into the future because they're both one-way deal or one-year deals. They are one way as well as we learned today, Uh, but they're both one-year deals. And I just think that it's a shrewd signing and it's a help to add depth to this organization for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Because as we mentioned off the top, the Eric Carlson deal still hangs in the balance. English is a difficult language and uh, the Penguins could end up losing potentially an NHL forward. And these guys help fill the roles and fill the, fill the holes. If it is any consolation, maybe you could try and learn some Swedish whenever uh, Eric Carlson ends up making his way across across the country. Um, Might have to. You have to learn, learn a little bit. Um, yeah, these are guys that are going to help fill those empty gaps. It's They're going to add competition. Like I asked Mike Sullivan during the season, whenever uh, they, tr- whenever they traded for the defenseman, Kulikov, does it add a level of competition? Absolutely. No matter what you do, when a player is added, it adds a level of competitiveness and a layer of, you know, a more driven mentality to maintain a spot in the NHL lineup. And these are guys that have had a taste of the NHL before. Now they're going to get the opportunity to fight to play alongside future Hall of Famers and Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. Maybe not share a line, but just be in the same dressing room, be on the same ice on occasion and have opportunities to, they're still young enough to have bright later stages of their career uh, to build something. One year deals, show me deals also. These guys have an opportunity to fight for an NHL spot and then prove that they can still do something. Maybe they could sign a three-year deal for cheap to close down and call it. It's going to be interesting to see what they can all do, and it's all adding to the competition within the team. 
We don't have to dive deeply into this, but I just thought about this just simply because it's silly season right now. It's July Absolutely. 11th. We're not going to have very much actual news between now and maybe September. I mean, the Eric Carlson deal, yes. Maybe one or two other contra- or maybe one or two other trades, I should say, yes. True uh, but- arbitration, but that's August 4th. We got it's that scheduled to get for to. August 4th. We could see if they, if they sign before then, but what would you think of a middle six like this? I'm not saying that Andreas Janssen is surefire should be a second liner, but what would you think about this middle six for the Pittsburgh Penguins? Riley Smith, Evgeny Malkin, Andreas Janssen, Alex Nylander, Lars Eller, Brian Rust. That's see, an just, interesting thing that I hadn't thought of until just now. Yeah, because I like the idea of spreading your scoring out mm-hmm. and Brian Russ is in need of some sort of rejuvenation offensively. Not that he had a bad season by any stretch of the means, but um, he, he did, needs but to still score 20 goals. Yeah, I also I totally forget just the full stats from last year. Mark. But <laughs> yeah, um, 46 points as compared to 58 the season before in way more yeah. games. Uh, yeah, he just needs some sort of new push. Uh, I could see dropping him to the third line to start the season as useful. You have to pick him up at some point, though. Um, this isn't the postseason anymore where it's you're sticking Kessel and Hagelin on your third line because you because you can. Uh, this is, you know, training grounds almost. So I don't hate it, especially if it is Russ that's getting pushed to the third line because he has – a bottom six mindset in reality. He's got that slight defensive game to him who can also score. I love that idea just because, um, mostly because Brian Rush should have been on the third line for a lot of last season, I felt, mm-hmm. given the way Nylander was performing and the way Ricard Raquel should not be taken off of Sidney Crosby's line. That is a new bridge we will cross when the season starts, and that chemistry probably just falls apart because... New, new bridge. That, yeah. That's a bridge that we've crossed many a times, which, by the way, I have a story uh, from Saturday that is actually pretty interesting, and I think people might like it. But regardless, uh, I think it's just we're at the point of the season, the off season, I should say, where we're just going to sit here and throw crap at the wall and see what sticks. And uh, that middle six configuration is something that I had not thought of. Even I know that, you know, Andreas Janssen's only been a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins for, you know, a handful of days. Yeah. But uh, that's an interesting Middle six. Let us know what you think in the comments of that middle six of what did I say? Riley Smith, Evgeny Malkin, and Andreas Janssen is the second line, and the third line of Alex Nylander, Lars Eller, and Brian Russ. Let us know what you think about that. And we will be back on the tip of the iceberg to talk a little bit more about the AHL Penguins. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. Horwat, as we mentioned in the first segment, that I was in Pittsburgh over the weekend Mm -hmm. to see the Ed Sheeran concert. And afterwards, you know, it's it's going to be busy. There's going to be a lot of traffic. So me and my fiance took our time. We walked across the bridge. We parked over in the Golden Triangle up by City Hall. Took a nice stroll, nice walk through the night. And... I always like, obviously, get on Boulevard of the Allies, shoot straight out the parkway. Well, I was unaware that that on-ramp was very closed. So I try to go on it. There's no sign that says that the actual on-ramp to 376 is closed. And by the time I get to the point where I notice that it's not open, the only option left is to go across the Liberty Bridge. Anybody knows Pittsburgh. Liberty Bridge. Yeah. If anybody knows Pittsburgh, they know the Liberty Bridge is in the opposite direction of Monroeville. I mean, you're, you're turning 90 degrees to go that way. Mm-hmm. And the only options at that point are I'm going to go up to Mount Washington or I'm going to go through the Liberty Bridge and have to circle back around, which is what my GPS took me. Circle back around and go through the Fort Pitt Bridge and then back out and drop down before you get to that on ramp. So in a matter of 10 minutes on Saturday night at about midnight, I went through three bridges or three tunnels. Sorry, I went over two bridges and through three tunnels in a matter of 10 minutes. I think that has to be a record. If it is any consolation, it only took you 10 minutes. Well, correct. By the time we got over that, that's why I started with, we walked thankfully, because by the time we walked out, everybody had already left the city. So we took a nice little stroll, but 10 minutes, two bridges, three tunnels. 
anybody want to let me know in the comments or, or message me on Twitter if you have beaten that in your lifetime? Because I feel like that has to be a record. I, you know, the funny thing is, is like it's a, it's a, that's an impressive number of all of those items. Probably not. <laughs> just <laughs> knowing this city and knowing these people and just knowing how common a bridge in a tunnel is. Oh yeah. I mean, that's just off the top. I'm thinking of crushing Fort Duquesne, Fort Pitt, and then there's Liberty Tubes, uh, the Fort Pitt Tunnel, I believe is that one, because I always get confused which one has the tunnel, which one's just the bridge, and then on top of Squirrel Hill Tunnel out in the back. Yep. I mean, Megan and I are we're happy that we moved up north. There are no tunnels. Just shoot straight in over veterans, and we're there yep. uh, into town, so hey it's uh it's a mess getting in and out of town yeah it was funny too because we sat next to a a lovely family from england and they were saying the one thing that we dislike about this city we love the city the one thing we dislike is trying to navigate it is a pain and they said "And, and we're from england so uh let's tell you that much and i was like oh yeah if once you learn it you know me being confident because i'd lived in pittsburgh for five years and then 376 the on-ramp from boulevard of the allies was closed and i was like you got to be kidding me i said that and now i got to deal with this now it's rather easy once you get back on to fort pitt because the on-ramp is literally right there you don't have to merge but thought that was interesting so let me know in the comments have you beaten two bridges three tunnels in a matter of 10 minutes because i mean you have to be there at the right time too because traffic could slow you down especially when you try to go out towards the squirrel hill tunnel i thought that was oh my god I was I was agitated because I was tired. So regardless, uh, let's start talking about stuff people actually care about because nobody cares about my travel issues from this past weekend. But why is it important, Horwat? You asked me this question. You, you answered it on Inside the Penguins. I want you to answer it here again. Why is it important to keep an eye on the Wilkes versus Grant and Penguins this season? There's just going to be a lot of competition. We just talked about competition in the last segment. There's going to be a lot of fighting for NHL spots, but then you know, with those guys like Henestroza and uh, Janssen and also players that we signed before this last week, like Redeem Zahorna coming back to the organization. Um, if I'm missing any more names, Mark Johnstone has not, he's yet to play in the NHL, but has that opportunity, has that chance with uh, continuing to stay with Kyle Dubas. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But there's also a ton of, it's basically a make or break year for a lot of prospects. Mm-hmm. Um, Sam Poulin, Sam Poulin comes to mind right away. Philip Hollander. Oh, wait, my bad. Reading the wrong name. Europe. Reading the wrong name. Valtteri Pusinen is a guy that mm-hmm. it's make or break time for a couple of them. You know, Nathan Leger, I really needs to prove himself finally before who knows what happens. Uh, Ty Smith, I'm assuming, will just be in the NHL, and I'm still hoping for that. Um, I don't know what Owen Pickering's deal is yet. I don't know if he's going to spend a lot more time in the AHL this year. But he has that chance. He has that three-year deal now penned uh, and ready to go if he needs to. And also Joel Blomquist said he's going to likely play Mm -hmm. on North American ice. So there's a lot of prospects with um, futures that it's going to make the competition at the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins, on the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins team, not only just within themselves, but for their futures. There's a lot riding on many of these players. It should Mm -hmm. make for a great product. Truthful, mm-hmm. it's going to be yeah. fun seeing the prospects grow and also these guys like we just talked about fight for NHL jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think we we started talking about it a lot last year because the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins really went young last year because for yeah. a while the Penguins had no prospects and the ones that they did have were still playing, whether that be in juniors or the USHL or over in Europe. Last year really started where a lot of the players started coming over. A lot of the players started coming into the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins and playing there. A lot of young players. We mentioned Lucas Svedkovsky made his professional debut last season with the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Poulin started his first full season there. Legger Ray had his first full season there. There were a lot of players. Ravis Ansons was playing his first full season there last season. So there was a lot of young players that we had heard about, but not necessarily watched all that much because they weren't easily visible to the NHL casual Pittsburgh Penguins fan. But once they get to Wilkes-Barre, there's a little bit more of a spotlight. They're playing in a professional style. They're playing North American for some of the guys that are coming over from Europe. So it changes a little bit 
and you see a little bit more of the progression once they hit the AHL level, and you learn a little bit more about each of these prospects once they get to the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins, and that's why we were excited last season to see a bunch of these guys. And like you said, that continues into this year. How will they progress going into year two for some of these guys? Yoel Blomqvist, which apparently, according to Seth Rohrbaugh, it's Yoel now. So now we know. Uh, at least he didn't wait until they won a Stanley Cup like Connor Sherry. But Yoel Blomqvist thinks it's likely that he's going to start his season at the AHL level, which is a huge thing because he is the best Penguins goaltending prospect that they have. Between him and Murashev, who's over in Russia, you're not going to see him in North America this season. So it's going to be an interesting season. I don't think you see Owen Pickering. There's a chance you do. I mean, he went back to Swift Current last season. I would think that the Penguins probably want him to at least start the season in Swift Current, play at that level, and then once the season ends over there, maybe play a handful of games at the AHL level. Uh, again, I'm not sure where they see his progression at. Um, mm -hmm. Braden Yeager is not going to be at the AHL level. Uh, he's going to go back and play for the Moose Jaw Warriors of the WHL. So probably not those two, but the majority of the top prospects for the Pittsburgh Penguins are going to be at the AHL level this year, which is always exciting. Uh, and I keep saying it. And listen, there's a lot going on for me in this next month, but we want to get some interviews in. And one of those is Nick Hart, who obviously is the play-by-play -play voice of the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. We had him on last year uh, when we were doing a, a series of Penguins lunches in the dead zone of the offseason. Got to get him back on to talk about some of these guys because it is going to be another exciting season for a lot of young Pittsburgh Penguins forwards and defensemen and their top goaltending prospect. Yeah, it's it's guys that are like, yeah, you talk about the young prospects that might not be there yet. Uh, Owen Pickering played eight games there to end off last season. So mm -hmm. who knows if they want to start him there or bring him back late this season again. Um, Braden Yeager just won't be there yet. That's fine. That's expected. But it's yeah. the young prospects that are the step away. They are ready for that jump. Sam Poulin got his first taste of NHL action. Um, we know about Terry Poussin that has already had played before but needs to get back in. Uh, it's make or break time for them. And we also forgot Will Butcher's down there. Oh, yeah. The Penguins did add Will Butcher. Yeah. Um, who I, that, that was the joke I was going to say whenever we were talking about Butcher and Janssen. And Henestrosa, man, this team would have popped off three years ago, three, four years ago with <laughs> yeah. uh, Will Butcher putting up all those points on the blue line. Yonsa with his 40-point season and Henestrosa with 39. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, it, it, it that just adds to the collective, oh, this is going to be a ton of fun at the mm -hmm. AHL level because I also, like, I don't know what other AHL team look, teams look like, but we <laughs> yeah. know most oftentimes it is the healthy mix of Here's the aged out veteran still just collecting a paycheck. And here is the young prospect trying to make it in the league. And then here are just the guys that aren't good enough. It makes for incredible action. I mean, you want to see a real discrepancy, watch some ECHL games. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But no, by the it, way, uh, we got to get out to a game in Lake Tahoe whenever they start playing. Ah, uh, Lake Tahoe. I forgot about all that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's going to make for great action for the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. And you know what? Good. That team hasn't had – not that they haven't been entertaining. They haven't had the – Success. Success <laughs> or just the, oh, finally, it's something to care about. Yeah. Like last year it was just who's there. All right, tell me when they come up. You know, the year before that it was who's there. All right, tell me when they come up. This year it is, oh, let's see what they can do. Let's see their progress. Let's mm -hmm. see something happen. They haven't had a deep run since like 2014, whenever Brian Rust was breaking out of the E, I think, to get there. I don't uh, think he was ever in the E. I thought he was. Who? Somebody was. But anyway, no, Casey I DeSmith was. Casey, yeah. Casey DeSmith was. was. No, I think Brian Rust went straight from Notre Dame to the AHL. Oh, I forgot he played Notre Dame. Maybe that's the goal I'm thinking of. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, either, exactly. yeah the Wilkes Barre Scranton Penguins is a great chance to have a pretty solid team this year. And it's a, mm -hmm. a lot of it weighs on. Like I said, those prospects butting up and those NHL veterans mm -hmm. uh, looking for spots, looking for roles. Yeah, and nothing gets people excited for AHL hockey like the future of the goaltending position. Remember back when Matt Murray was tearing it up at the AHL? Remember when Tristan Jari was tearing it up in the AHL? Everybody was checking the box score and saying, how did the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins do tonight? Everybody was watching the highlights. How did this young rookie sensation goaltender do? Yoel Blomqvist 
is in that conversation. He was really good last season in Sweden and or, sorry, in Finn Finland in the uh, SM Liga. I always mix up the SM Liga in Finland and the Swedish Professional League, but he he killed it in Finland last year. We'll see what he's able to do this season if indeed he does stick around and play at the AHL level. Which brings me to my next question, Horwat. Which AHL Penguin are you most excited to watch this upcoming season? If I just had to pick one, I'm going to land on uh, Yul Blomquist just because if it's always interesting seeing these guys play a North American ice for the first time. I know he's a goalie, and the, the main point is to stop puck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can do that anywhere in the world, but um, still, he's going to be taking on his first ever uh, North American professional experience. Uh, and from the videos and clips that I saw from uh, the development camp, he looked solid. He looked composite almost. That, that was kind of a good way to put it in my head, at least. Um, he wasn't the young goalie flailing everywhere he could to get from one post to the other. He looked very, not stiff, but just put together. Very, mm-hmm. here I am positionally sound, composed, yeah. Yeah. making my smooth the smooth moves from here to there and making uh good saves and that's great considering he was derailed last season by a couple of injuries i think a concussion squeaked in there so it's good to see he looks healthy he looks composed and not you know flailing all over the place or i don't want to say out of place or nervous but he looks like he belongs there yeah we, as we know for goaltenders half the battle is mental, especially you're getting in there. You're getting behind some of these shots that are 90 miles an hour, sometimes reaching hundred miles an hour, not often in games, but you know, you have to be there mentally, especially when you give up a bad goal. We've seen it happen to pretty much every goaltender. Uh, You give up a bad goal and it ruins the rest of the game for you. It might ruin the rest of the series for you in the playoffs. So if he's there mentally, that's half the battle. And then it's just getting him there physically. So hopefully he's there. You know, obviously I haven't watched a whole lot of Joel Blomqvist. Joel Blomqvist, it's going to take some getting used to. But I agree with you. I'm, I'm very excited to see what he's able to do. He played 24 games in the Finnish Liga last season for Carpat, including the playoffs. He had a 2.125 goals against average and a 901 save percentage. So yeah, I'm excited for Blomqvist as well. Somebody that I'm also excited for, yeah, we want to watch Sam Poole in and see what he's able to do. We want to watch Nathan Legare and what could be a make-or-break year. If not, he becomes an overaged AHLer and an overaged prospect, basically. Yes, Valtteri Pustin was phenomenal last year. Yes, Alex Nylander, if he's got down there, was phenomenal last year at the AHL level. We want to see them make the jump. I want to see what Lucas Svedkovsky is going to be able to do in year two. Because this guy, from all indications, has all the talent in the world. The question is, can he put it together? Can he become an NHL caliber player? Year one, 47 games played, 15 points, three of them goals, 12 of them assists. I want to see what he's able to do because he's only 21. He did that at the age of 20. He's a very, very young player, a young prospect. It'll be interesting to see how his progression is going into year two. Now that he knows what to expect, now that he knows how to prepare, I want to see if that talent can translate into becoming a top prospect for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He is certainly an interesting name. He's certainly one of their better prospects. I want to see if he can turn into one of their top prospects in the 2023-24 season. That's somebody I'm really excited to watch, especially once training camp opens. I'm hoping to come up again uh, like I did last season, and I want to see what Svedkovsky is able to do. And I'm sure he can make that push. I'm also trying to find, I know <clears throat> Jacob Hunter, who we had on the show, you know, work, writes with uh, – inside the Penguins with us, put out the top 10, put out a list of the top 10 prospects in the Penguins system. Mm-hmm. And I want to s- try to like nail down because I had didn't one, two, a bunch of these guys should be making AHL, getting AHL playing time. Mm-hmm. So like there's your, the guys to always watch for. Um, I don't believe Svetkoski made his list, but can easily make it with another good season down there with some extra push with some extra time and can easily find his way on it because the prospect pool wasn't deep still, but we're excited about the few that we have and they can all be NHL talent someday. So if he's able to push himself onto a list like this, that could be a ton of fun. 
We'll have to wait and see what's up with that. Like I said, we got to get Nick Hart on. I mean, the guy is mm-hmm. literally an encyclopedic knowledge of the Wilkes Bear Scranton Penguins. So we'll get him on. Uh, hopefully, if not in July, we'll get him on in August, uh, the few weeks that either of us are available in August. But uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we have two listener questions to get to today. So we'll get to those right after this. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. We have two listener questions to get to today. Let's start with Adam Burt. Adam asks, would you guys think either John Gibson or Connor Hellebuck would fit with the Pittsburgh Penguins? We'll get to that there in a second. The Pittsburgh Penguins obviously signed Tristan Jari to a five-year contract extension on the opening day of NHL free agency. So before we get to would they have been a fit, I will ask you this, Horwat. Do you think the door isn't completely shut on the Penguins goaltending situation this summer? Uh, I think because we made the depth signings <clears throat> of Nadelkovich and Magnus Helberg, who is someone we also didn't talk about when it comes to the AHL and uh, mm-hmm. Being a mentor for uh, Joel Blomquist and Taylor Gautier, who's also down there, I think the door is basically closed. Um, mm-hmm. Just we've filled out the roster. Both rosters have six goalies now, or three goalies now. We have yeah. six in, in the system that are vying for the NHL one day or have NHL experience. It's pretty much. I don't want to say set in stone just because the Casey to Smith thing that could still change. Uh, but it looks like we're looking at our depth chart of six NHL goalies or six goalies in the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's pretty well said and done as for if it is better or worse than bringing in a guy like Gibson or Hellebuck, that's a discussion that is up in the air. And mm-hmm. depending on the return, the ducks or jets get for those two. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a different discussion as well. I'd say for now that it's pretty much set and the door is yeah. closed, but that's a discussion to have during the season. Maybe see what kind of return is had and where everyone's performance is. Yeah, I would agree that the door is probably pretty closed on, on any more moves. And as far as the goaltender, uh, the only thing I will say is yes, the penguins probably needed to make that signing of Tristan Jari, we've gone over that a couple different times because if you don't do that, somebody else signs them, now where are you at? Mm -hmm. None of these goaltenders have been traded. And now you're desperate for a goaltender. So, yeah, could it have been we're going to sign him and then give him a modified no-move clause and then hope that one of his teams that aren't on his no-move clause are one of the teams that we want to trade for a goaltender with? And That becomes a little bit of a big-brain scenario for me. So I would say, yes, it it is a closed, done deal that Tristan Jari is the starting goaltender for the Pittsburgh Penguins for at least next season. Of course, things can change. Uh, This league has a lot of different players. They get traded very quickly. Um, But I do think that you're going to watch Tristan Jari as the Pittsburgh Penguins starting goaltender. Now, the question is, he included a mock draft, or sorry, a mock trade, I should say, uh, via cap friendly that included Mikhail Granlund, Casey DeSmith. He added on the the caveat that he'd add some draft capital, likely a first-round pick, and either one of Pierre Olivier Joseph or Ty Smith in a trade for Connor Hellebuck. Does that get the Pittsburgh Penguins even into the conversation with the Winnipeg Jets for, for the services of the former Vezina winner? I mean, the first round pick needs to be in there. If not, maybe a second pick somewhere. You know, it's, it's something you would have to explore, right? If if that's the price and it gets you into the conversation, I mean, Kyle Dubas said it himself. He said, when there's a player of that caliber that's on the market, you're going to call and see what the price is at the yeah. very least. At the so, very least. Yes, the Penguins would call and see what the price is. Would they be able to get in the conversation for, for Hellebuck? Probably not. Uh, probably not. Probably at not. Point. Oh, and it's, at this point, we both mentioned, yeah. at this point, the door is, is pretty much closed on the Pittsburgh Penguins adding one of these big guys. But I think it's also interesting that, you know, as soon as the season ended, they were saying, okay, the, the quote was out there. John Gibson, mm-hmm. I will not, I do not want to play another game as an Anaheim Duck. Connor Hellebuck, 
the the Winnipeg Jets, they're going to make some big changes. It's what been Pierre Luc Dubois and Blake Wheeler, and that's mm-hmm. been the only changes as of right now. And more need to come from that organization. Mark Shifley probably won't stick around, and obviously Connor Hellebuck likely isn't staying. Mm-hmm. So they still need to make their changes, and the ball is pretty much in everyone else's court to make the phone call. And yes. Yeah. Because they're because those are two guys that don't want to keep playing there. They don't want to keep riding this train of nothing really going anywhere. So it's yeah. tough, and they need to make those moves. That doesn't necessarily lower the doesn't the trade. lower the price. Yeah, it doesn't lower the price though. So I take it from the Penguins and Eric Carlson right now. He wants out. He's requested his trade. That doesn't mean the price gets any lower. Yeah, it should, but it doesn't. Yeah, especially when a team in San Jose is not trying to contend, so they can eat that 11.5 for another year and wait for a better offer to come around. Yeah. So uh, yeah. they, they, they could they could eat it, and they could say, you know what? Offer's off the table. I know he wants traded, but it's not how it works. He signed a contract. Um, but it's not just those two. I mean, Carter Hart was rumored to be on the trade block. Carter Hart is still a member of the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, there were some rumors that the Nashville Predators were going to get rid of one of their goaltenders, whether that be UC Soros or Yaroslav Askarov. Both of them remain on the Nashville Predators. So none of these goaltenders that were on the trade market have been traded. It's yeah. not to say that they won't, but that market is very, very slow, almost to the point of it being completely stagnant, which makes it a good thing for the Pittsburgh Penguins to have a guy in Tristan Jari that, yes, uh, people are against him. We've gone down that rabbit hole enough. Uh, we will not do that on this episode. But another question that we were asked, this one by Hanky on Twitter, says, how different would the pens and caps be? in terms of overall success, Stanley Cup wins, and longevity, stuff like that, had Evgeny Malkin gone to D.C. and Ovi came to Pittsburgh. If you do not remember, Alex Ovechkin was taken by the Washington Capitals with the first overall selection of the 2004 NHL entry draft. Evgeny Malkin was selected second to the Pittsburgh Penguins. How would things have changed if that scenario was switched? I mean, listen, I think because of the position they, that each of those two play, I mean, you're sticking immediately. Crosby with Ovechkin for yep. – we're, we're going on 20 years. Ovechkin might already have the goals record. <laughs> like, That's hard to imagine, but, yeah, you're, you're, the, not, you're not out of the realm of possibility with that. With the scoring ability of Ovechkin and the playmaking ability of Crosby, those two sharing a line, even with Crosby's injuries loaded in there. He might. Here's the thing. That too, though. Uh, yeah, as a, if, even with let's say Crosby's injuries are loaded in there, who knows where Ovechkin's goal count sits? But it's probably still an astronomical number because of the way those two. First of all, it, yeah, it was All Star games. We've seen them play together. They seem to have a nice little, little, fr- uh, little uh, rivalry competitiveness, but also chemistry. Um. Those two playing together would be just insane. And we'll get to the Washington part in a second because I know you want to make your points. But those two on the Penguins, there's no telling what those numbers could look like. There really isn't. Uh, it would just be dumb stupid, though. Yeah, dumb stupid seems like the, the, the perfect the perfect way to describe it. It would be ridiculous. Like, yeah, do you I mean, remember every... how good – like, people forget sometimes how good both Alex Ovechkin and Sidney Crosby were – immediately imagine if they were playing on the same freaking line i get there's only one puck but the way that Sidney crosby even though early in his career he was much more of a goal scorer than he is now Sidney crosby was always a facilitator first mm-hmm. like he was great at goal scoring goals but he was a facilitator first and if he had a trigger man like alex ovechkin oh my god it would be ridiculous does the 1980s edmonton oilers come to mind yes it's a lot of Stanley Cups for the Pittsburgh Penguins. We'll get to that in a second. But you mentioned the injuries. There's a chance that Sidney Crosby doesn't get injured because how many times have people said you need somebody out there to deter, to deter, to deter, but you don't want to put somebody out there that's a Ryan Reeves, right? You, you, it didn't work with Ryan Reeves. But if you had Alex Ovechkin, a 50-goal scorer, that also deters people from hitting Crosby, Crosby might not get injured, and then what happens? And then what happens? I mean, everybody's been showing the 
the stats of him from, I think it was like 2011 to 2013, where he had 160 <sighs> points in 80 games played, despite missing Whoa. so many different games. Imagine if he didn't get hurt in that time span and was playing with Alex Ovechkin. I mean, these are all what ifs. This is all hypothetical, oh, yeah. but like, that's ridiculous. And when I mentioned the 1980s Edmonton Oilers, I think the Penguins become the most dominant team in NHL history from at least 2006 to 2015. Probably win twice as many cups. I think they have at least six at that point. Just because, yes, the Blackhawks of that era were great. But if you take all of these things into consideration, they still likely draft Latang in that draft. They still have Flurry because he was drafted in 2003. The only real main piece that changes, other than Evgeny Malkin, of course, in this hypothetical, they probably don't get Jordan Stahl the next year. But at the oh, end well. of the day, you still have Flurry, Latang, Ovechkin, and Crosby. Nobody's beating that. I know you have to build a team around them. But does yeah. that really hinder how the Penguins built the rest of the team around them? No, you would just need a center. You would yeah, just and- need a center. And it's not like center depth was the only way to championships. Look at the Blackhawks of those years. Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, center, winger. Penguins would have been unstoppable. That it's it, it, There's no doubt in my mind that they mm-hmm. would be the best team in NHL history if that had happened. Yeah, and as for the capital side of things... I mean, Malkin's a great player. We all know this. Top 100 of all time. He definitely becomes the number one center in Washington for years and years and years. Yes. Maybe he does bring – because we here's the other, like, the other mind-bending thing to think about is that we've obviously never seen Malkin go – and we've seen him as the number one guy. Yeah. We've never seen it in the long-term aspect, though. Mm-hmm. We've never seen what he can do overall, even full season, as the number one center. Uh there's always been either his injury or Crosby's injury and then Crosby coming back, this, that, the other. We've never seen what Malcolm can do over a full season or even a full two seasons. Uh, so who knows really what could have been unlocked from Malkin by himself. Uh, it makes the Nicholas Backstrom thing interesting because, again, they're both centers. Who knows exactly how that dynamic works in Washington because Backstrom was always Ovechkin's setup, man. Well, now it's Malkin doing everything on the first line center. Who knows who was? I can't think of the. Getting Malkin the and Alexander Semen. There, there you go. That's interesting. That is. Uh, <laughs> that and then with young Simeon Varlamov back in the net. I mean, all of a sudden we're looking at the Washington Capitals. Like, are we sure these guys are based in Washington and not Moscow? <laughs> um, yeah, they're the Capital City Capitals. That's what they are. <laughs> yep. Uh, they take the red star a little seriously. It's it, oh there's God. a lot of interesting dynamics that could have happened with the Washington Capitals had that been the the case. And it's, I mean, who knows? Like I said, who knows what could have been unlocked in Malkin being the number one guy for his career? Oops, mm-hmm. being the leader, being the the go to guy. I bet they still get a cup out of it. Honestly, you build that team properly in other ways because you know again revisionist history you got your guy now you got to find a scoring winger you do i'm sure you do eventually somewhere mm-hmm. maybe at that point they probably recruit kovalchuk instead of him going to the devils right like There's oh look all these other russians there boom that team all like just that team also probably brings its own dynamic i think they probably still could have gotten one at some point yeah um but again, it's hard to really pinpoint whenever we haven't seen Wall can be the true number one guy. And we've had the chance to see it this season, but Ron Hextall said we're keeping him, which good. Mm-hmm. But still, you get where yeah. I'm getting at. Yeah, I mean, there as everybody learned from Back to the Future and we learned in college from watching Until Dawn, there's a butterfly effect to these things. If you go back and change and certain decisions can change the outcome of the future. Uh, not sure how it would have changed, but I will tell you one thing. Kenny Malkin would get a lot more respect if he would have went to, to Washington because he would have been the number one guy. And, mm-hmm. and people, hashtag people forget how damn good Evgeny Malkin was from the time he got into the league. I mean, still, he's really good. But the level that he was at, the dominance that he was able to show on a day-to-day basis and a game-to-game basis. I mean, the 2009 Stanley Cup playoffs, people forget how good he really was in that playoffs. Yep. Go back and watch the Hurricane series. Go back. I, I saw Jay Fresh put out a player card of Evgeny Malkin, uh, comparing him to Leon Dreisaitl of, I believe it was current day, to Evgeny Malkin in 2012. Evgeny Malkin, right there. Like, he was that 
damn good. And people forget that because at the same time, it's always been, well, Crosby, 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 as it should be. Listen, Sidney Crosby is a transcendent top five player of all time, but Evgeny Malkin is much higher than a top 100, uh, and the disrespect would not have been as real. Uh, I, I mean, the disrespect would not have been as there as much uh, yeah. if Evgeny Malkin was in Washington and was the, the figurehead there. And the depth down the middle, I mean, Malkin Backstrom is a great one too down the middle. One, and, yeah. You know, Alexander Semen was a great winger for them for a long time. Um, Mike Green on the back end would have probably had much more of an assist plethora if he was still uh, passing to Evgeny Malkin. I mean, it's not like Malkin in those early days was, yeah, he wasn't the goal scorer that that Alex Ovechkin was, but Evgeny Malkin could put the puck in the back of the net with the best of them. Just trying to think of like some of the later, uh, some of the later Capitals teams now. Like, look, obviously they, obviously these guys stay there. Suddenly you're sticking Malkin with Kuznetsov. Tom Wilson and Malkin, that is a scary proposition. Imagine trying to handle a line of Malkin, Wilson, uh, Oshie. <laughs> it's a lot first, of girth. Yeah, first of all, there's you're <laughs> you're not getting past that. And it's not even like they're playing defense. You're just not getting past them because they're so sizable. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> and then Kuznetsov is on the back end with Backstrom. And it, like I said, this could this could have been a very good team in their own right. So yeah. That's a, a frightening thought. But again, I mean, that's goal scoring ability between Crosby and Ovechkin, though, to take it back to the beginning of this is whew, unmatched. Yeah. You, we've seen them in, like you mentioned, in all star games. And yes, it's Hollem Globe Trotters. Yes, it's basically shinny. But it, I mean, hey. if those guys are playing from the age of 18 on, you don't know how those personalities would have meshed because that was a big point of contention early was yeah. the personality of Crosby versus the bombastic personality of Alex Ovechkin. Uh, you know, that's what built the rivalry. One's Russian, one's Canadian. They're both wonder kids, uh, wonder kins. I've been watching too much Ted Lasso, um, <laughs> but you know, I don't know how that works, but at the end of the day, when you get on the ice, both of these guys wanted to win. And I, I think they would have figured that out. Yeah. Who's, Who's riding a uh, third wheel on that line? <laughs> Who, Boy, who uh, who's a player? right winger? I mean, if they, the... still, if they still went out and got Chris Kunitz, that would work. I mean, Kunitz's career is probably cut short because he gets hit by so many freaking shots uh, by Alex Ovechkin trying to get in front. And, you know, Kunitz, Hornquist would have fit really oh. well with the two of them. I mean, I don't. Gensel would have had to switch to his off wing. No, you're but, just like... but but then again, if you get to that point, Gensel probably stays at center because let's not forget he was he was the center as well. Yeah, and I'm just because I'm just picturing who's playing the third wheel on that line, like because that's essentially what their career mm. turns into. Right? I mean, it's... Eric Christensen early on. Oh boy, oh boy. Mark Recchi in the first season probably still. Good Lord Almighty. Yeah, maybe yeah, Bill Guerin in 2009. Again, butterfly effect. You don't know how any of this would have shaped out, but like going by if everything else stayed the same, some interesting lines would have been had on the Pittsburgh Penguins <laughs> over the years. But that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you again to both of our listeners who submitted questions this week. Adam and Hanky, both great questions, of course. And like we say every single week, this is three weeks in a row that we've gotten questions. We've yeah. answered all four that have been sent to us now. So um, if away. you have a question, even if it's one of these fun hypotheticals, we'll get into it in the last episode or last segment, usually of the podcast, but uh, we will get into it as well. Um, just DM us on Twitter at iceberg podcast, but that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you guys next time. Hopefully with uh, some actual news to discuss. If not, we'll always find a discussion to talk about.